you know, a lot of times we take things that have been maybe singular missions that the Lord has put people on, and then we start building theology around those those things, you know. Um, kind of like, you know, when you're looking at maybe IHOP or something like that, where they, they feel like they're praying into a release of the glory over a, re re uh, a region or something like that, like they're, you know, going against principalities and all this other stuff. Um, and, and you start going after, you know, waging war. It's like when I go to Denmark, you know, there's a place where I guess, you know, the Vikings used to offer sacrifices to the Nordic gods and stuff like that. And so people feel like they have to go up there and they have to throw down the altars of the principalities and all that kind of stuff. And, and my thing is, okay, you know, I want everything to be biblical. So where is that biblical? Where did, where did Paul tell the Gentiles that they need to go to Corinth and, and to the Parthenon and overthrow the, the altars of Athena? Or go to Ephesus, to the Temple of Diana? <laughs> go to the Temple of Diana and overthrow the altars of, 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 in the principalities around, around the Temple of Diana. See, the, this is... What does Paul say you know, when he's talking about meat offered up in the idols? Demons are not. You know, if you believe demons are something, then you're going to be a warfare. If you believe demons are nothing, then you're not a warfare. Like, I don't, I don't live in warfare. I sleep. Sleep during the storms. The enemy. Mm -hmm. Am I worried that the devil's going to attack me? No. Why? Because I'm in charge of the seeds I sow. That's just the truth. I get to sow seeds. Listen, I get to go. Does that mean principalities and all this stuff? Oh, I've got principalities showing up in meetings. Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one. I, I was at a meeting. There's a bunch of people there. I was in Illinois, back in the States. And, and um, man, I, man, I just preached for like, you know, five months. By six hours, I don't know. <laughs> like I normally do. Man, I was so excited. I could just feel like God's going to just blow this place up. I jump off the stage. Everybody's lined up. I start on one side. I'm just like, fire, fire. I go about five people. Nothing happens. It's like hitting a wall. So the first thing I do is I'm going like this. I feel the resistance. I turn around from everybody, and I go straight into a conversation with God. So the first thing I did, I said, God, what's going on? I said, there's a principality here at the meeting right now, and it's holding back the glory of God from Paul. Wow. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to stand on stage, tell everybody the principality is here, and that it's trying to resist the glory of God. And then tell them when you count to three for every single one of them to shout the name of Jesus. <laughs> so I did. That's exactly what I said. And everyone shouted. I mean, it went on for 45 seconds to a minute and a half of just Jesus. All these people were just, ah, this roar came out. I jumped off stage and started laying hands. Everybody, the glory of God, just boom, 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 boom. Glory of God just hit. You know, the prayer groups come up to me after this. We've been warring against that principality. What was his name? So I don't know what his name was. Why do I need to know his name? See, where do we feel like we have to know the names of the devils? You know, you, sometimes I forget how big my reach is sometimes. I remember, remember about 13 years ago, I wrote a post one time. There was a book at Barnes & Noble bookstore, and it was the names of the devils. It was a deliverance manual book. And I just wrote, I took a picture of it, I put it on Facebook, and said, look, I don't I don't need to know the de names of demons. They need to know my name, that I'm submitted to Jesus. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, the writer of the book is commenting. I'm like, oh, Lord, I didn't think the writer would find out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I had tagged the writer of the book, and this is my life's work. I'm just like, I'm sorry. You spent your life trying to figure out the names of demons? You spent your life trying to figure out the names of Jesus? Names of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, come on. Yeah. I care less what devils are doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's not, it, it, listen, like I said, I take people through deliverance all the time. I am. Demons are nothing. The devil's nothing. So, so the first position of spiritual warfare is to this. John 16, I'll send the Holy Spirit who will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The sin is not believing in me. The righteousness is that I'm ascending to the right hand of the Father. And the judgment is I've defeated the prince of this world. And judged. So that's, that's my position number one. The judgment that Holy Spirit comes to earth is not toward me, but toward the devil. You're defeated. In other words, Holy Spirit isn't shouting how bad you are, but how good Jesus is. Well, doesn't it say that he, he, he convicts the world of their sin? Yeah, but he also defines what that sin is. Unbelief in me. So again, the sin that Holy Spirit convicts the world of is their unbelief in Jesus. How many of you, you know, whether you were young or old, you get to that one beautiful verse in the New Testament where Jesus is like, whoever blasphemes against the Father is forgiven. You can say anything about the Son, that's forgiven. But if you speak against the Holy Spirit, it's the unforgivable sin. And you're like, what's that? But he doesn't really go give you any context there. <laughs> you know, to a 12-year-old, you're just like, oh, I, well, I need a list. I need, like, what is this? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do it because it's unforgivable. Is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit preaching the wrong gospel? Out of ignorance, no. Is it prophesying wrong? No. Is it is it maybe saying something that's Holy Spirit isn't Holy Spirit? No. Then what is it? In this case, Jesus is casting out a devil. And the Pharisees, out of their jealousy, would rather say that Jesus was casting out the devil out of the name of the prince of the devil, Beelzebub, than to, to accuse him of being not submitted to God. So they blamed him and said, you're casting out devils because you got devils all in you. And Jesus said, be careful. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The unforgivable sin. Now, Holy Spirit is the what? It's here to glorify and testify of Jesus. That's the whole purpose. It's that he will come and he will glorify and testify of me. So what would be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Denying the very works of the Holy Spirit. Ooh, think about that. So why is the purpose of Holy Spirit moving through Jesus' life, through our lives, is to what? To bring people into the reality that the name of Jesus is real. That's right. That's the whole point of it. So casting out a demon actually testifies and glorifies Jesus. Healing the sick testifies and glorifies Jesus. To say that it's demonic or it's not holy is to actually restrict people from the very thing that pulls them into an awareness of God. So that's, that's scary. You know, a lot of people who have spoken very harsh things toward the move of God. Out of their own ignorance a lot of times. Out of ignorance. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. See, no one comes to the Father since he's drawn by the Spirit. Think about it. No one can come to God unless the Spirit draws them. And so from the day you're born to the day you die, the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart. Drawing you into an encounter with God. Think about that. From the moment breath comes in your lungs, God is trying to pull you into an encounter through the Holy Spirit. Remember Paul when on the road to Damascus when the light appeared and he fell to the ground. And what was the thing that Jesus said? Paul, why do you kick against the pricks? 
<laughs> Why do you kick against those moments that when Stephen was laying in the dirt and he looks up and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And he takes that last hit to the head. Paul's heart. He felt that way. Something happened in that moment. He's holding the coats, a young Saul. And he's watching the sin. He got to see Jesus manifest the same way he did on the cross through Stephen. And Stephen said the same thing that Jesus said. Father, forgive him. Father, forgive him. And so in that moment, his heart was cut. Remember, remember on the day of Pentecost when they cried out, what? Their hearts were cut open and they said, what must we do to be saved? Let me just tell you, when was the last time someone ran up to you and said, what must I do to be saved? No, I get to have that happen. I get to have that happen at parks. But people grab me at a coffee shop. What must I do to be saved? It was a powerful moment. But the Lord reminded me the other day, he was like, when was the last time someone ran up to you and said that? And I just, I, I got heavy in my heart. Oh my goodness, it's been a few years. It's been a few years. He says, I know. And what it was showing me was I was not living in the level of intimacy that I could be living in, that I'm reflecting the glory of God wherever I go. So I just began to repent. I was like, Lord, forgive me. How do I reflect the glory of God? How? Obedience. Obedience. There's only one way to reflect the glory of God, and it's obedience. It's not words. You can heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and not do it under obedience. You can do it for your own name, your own ministry, your own pocket. The man who goes to Pakistan and preaches to 20,000 20, give their life to Jesus, but God never told him to go, mm. gets no reward. Mm. His reward is wood, hand, skull, the very thing he stood on to proclaim his ministry, not the gospel. Mm. But the housewife who buys the coffee for the person next to him because they heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, hey, yeah, I have a coffee down my mouth. Mm. Gold, silver, and precious stones. The more you're obedient to that voice, the more you adorn yourself with gold, silver, and precious stones. That's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 3, let your temple be filled with gold, silver, and precious stones. Now what's the point of that? When you shine a light on gold, silver, and precious stones, what does it do? It reflects light. It reflects light. That's good. They don't see you, they see Jesus. When you shine light on wood, hay, and stuff, what does it do? It absorbs light. Doesn't reflect it. And so obedience to the voice of God and hearing the voice of Holy Spirit. So the purpose of Holy Spirit is to draw us into the encounter with the Father. So to deny the very works of the Holy Spirit is to block ourselves off from coming into an encounter with God. Think about that. So, from the day you're born to the day you die, your heart is being pricked by the Holy Spirit to bring you into an encounter with Jesus. Let's say you harden your heart. Harden your heart. Harden your heart. So the reality is you don't go to hell because of your sins. This is the reality. No one goes to hell for their sins. They go to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus. And believing in Jesus is not bowing your head and saying a prayer. Believing in Jesus is having a relationship. You shall know them by their love. The letter says you will know them by their works. And then we turn around and we, we create spiritual warfare. Like, you, know, you just don't know what. Man, the devil's just after me. 
Greater levels, greater devils, friends. Uh -oh. How many have heard that statement? Mm -hmm. Greater levels, greater devils. Great range. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we, we talk about, so is there, is there moments, there's principality, we see this in Daniel. Remember Daniel prays to the Lord? Gideon immediately, boom. Gideon standing in front of him. The moment you prayed, I came. He sent me. Wow. Instant. And then all of a sudden, what happened? There was another time he prays, and he prays, and he prays. For 21 days, he doesn't get an answer. Where's Gabriel at? Gabriel comes in. He's like, I've been stuck in a battle in the heavens. The, the power and the principality over the prince of Persia warred against me. And Michael had to come and break it up. Yes. And now I'm here. Isn't it? So that, that's an amazing. So we see that. But I, I, want, I want you to understand something right now. I hear a lot of Christians say, man, when I get to heaven, oh, can't wait to ask Daniel what it was like to talk to Gideon. Mm. Can't wait to sit around and hear Elijah tell some stories. Or ask David, what was it like to kill a giant? I want you to understand they're going to be running up to you and they're going to ask you a simple question. What was it like to carry God in you? What was it like for the very presence of God to live inside of you? See, we, we, we live in all of the Old Testament and the mighty works, but you need to understand there's a mightier work in you. Listen, in all of Solomon's glory and all his wisdom, you have a greater wisdom inside of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the beautiful architecture of the, of the first and second temple, the second temple went way further and more extravagant than the first temple was ever. It had Roman architecture included in it. They said it was extravagant. It was, it was amazing. It was beautiful. But the temple that's inside of you is more beautiful than anything that has ever been created by the hands of man. You know what lives inside of you. We stand in wonder with Daniel and all this other stuff and we try to draw our theology from Genesis to Malachi, not understanding that we have something, a greater glory inside of us. Since the glory that was on the ministration of death and grave on stones, how much greater glory do we have through the ministry of the Spirit of God? <clears throat> that the children of Israel had to go out and gather manna from the earth. We have the very manna of heaven living inside of us. That mm. they, they had to watch Moses grab a hold of Aaron's staff and touch the Red Sea to part. <coughs> the very one who walked on the sea, living inside of you. And quickly we trade the beauty of what we have received in this gospel for stories when you have something much greater inside of you. So when we draw the conclusions of spiritual authority and, 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 and spiritual warfare, I need you to understand you do not find the answers in Genesis through Malachi. You find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The simple reality is the devil could not touch Jesus. Why? He says it. The God of this world has come to me and found nothing in me. So he has departed for a more opportune time. This is what Jesus said. Meaning the devil came to me and he found nothing that he could take. He found no room in my heart for him. I was completely filled with the Father. 
So that what does that say? If the devil's attacking you, it's because you're giving him ground. You're permitting him access. You're giving him the keys to your heart. You're not searching the Lord with all your heart. Wow. You're, you're leaning on your own understandings and all your ways. You haven't acknowledged him. He's not directing your path. You're making your own path. You're forging your own way. He's not a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. He's not ordering the steps of you, your life. Because you've walked outside of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Whoever abides in Christ does not sin. 1 John chapter 3. Say it again. Whoever abides in Christ does not sin. Let's go a little bit further. Whoever, John chapter, uh, first John chapter 2. Whoever says that they abide in Christ should walk just as he walked. How many of you say, oh, I abide in Christ? Okay. Do you walk just as you walked? Let's get rid of a pride. In my best days, and oh man, I've had some good days. I remember one time I, I went through this season with the Lord where my heart. I was so overwhelmed by his love. I was so wrecked by him. That I would I would go out in public and I would just weep like a baby the entire time. I, I never had a dry eye. I would sit at a table and just weep because I could literally feel the weight and the hunger of the Lord for everyone in the room. Wow. I had I felt like I had really entered in to his suffering. And as I'm as I'm sitting there, I remember just signs and wonders all started happening around me. It was just uncontrollable. It wasn't any I was not trying to do a thing. Just sitting outside of Starbucks one day and next thing I know there's 15 people laid out in the glory. <laughs> The workers have their face pressed against the glass, trying to see what's going on. I walk into a coffee shop, the two ladies come running across the coffee They go, what's in your eyes? What's going on with your face? It's, it's like I'm looking into a light. I just started weeping. I was like, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. Just a grace to lead people right to the throne. It was beautiful. In, in my greatest moments, my greatest hours of awareness, I probably was like at 4% mm -hmm. of what I could possibly do. Being fully possessed with Jesus. See, I love throwing myself under the bus. Because when I mean there's more, there's more. There's more. And when he says, whoever abides, says they abide in Jesus, should walk just as he walked. Not just sitting at a table. You've spent three and a half years loving the hell out of a group of guys. You've heard them grind, complain. And now you sit and say, hey, let's have dinner together. It's Passover weekend. I'm about to be the lamb slain. I'm about to be cut open and my blood put upon the doorpost of every heart. That anyone who calls upon my name, death will pass over. What Jesus was. It's passive. It's the spotless lamb. They have no clue who's really sitting in front of them. And he says, You're all, you're all gonna deny me. You're all gonna run up. 
You're going to be like sheep scattered. That's what he, that's what he said. Every single one of them. He's poured three and a half years into these men. He just called one of them. He said, upon this rock, upon the revelation that I am the Christ, the Messiah, I'm going to build the church, Peter. And here's the key. Right here. The moment he saw Peter, he changed his name. He put it you know, Peter the name of the receives the rock. The rock. The one that was denied him. The one that cracked and complained. You're the rock. That's how I see you, Peter. You're unmovable. <laughs> You're all going to deny me. You're all going to run off. John's got his head on his bosom. I'm the disciple who Jesus loves. I'm the closest. Peter's like, hey, hey, John, ask him. Ask him who's going to deny him. Who's going to sell him out? John says, I'm the closest. John ran out of his clothes trying to escape persecution. And then he looks at him. He says, let me wash your feet. Let's break bread. Let's make covenant. I love you. Could you imagine that was your last moment with Jesus as he stretched him and put him on a cross. He ripped out his beard. Stuck his head with thorns, tore his flesh from his side, and pierced him. That was the last moment they had with him. Let's break bread and make covenant. I love you. You're worth it. I'm going to go and I'm going to shout the greatest marriage proposal the world's ever heard. Will you marry me? As he nails himself to the cross. You're worthy. Could you imagine the grief in their heart in that moment? The condemnation they would feel the moment he was alive. It was great joy, but great sorrow. You could always oh, should have done that. Should have believed that. And then he gives them the Holy Spirit and they just become like raging, fiery prophets and evangelists. <laughs> this is the gospel. We say we believe. We say, oh, I would count. Would the world say we're a hypocrite? Would our families point out our hypocrisy? We put on a face, we become comedians, we present ourselves a way that truly doesn't reflect his nature at all. At the end of the day, like I said at last night, there's a lot I believe, there's a lot I know in this world, but there's very little I truly believe yet. Because if I believed it, how many would say, oh, I believe that Jesus can raise the dead? Everybody in this room would raise their hand. So why haven't you raised the dead? You don't truly believe it. It's, a, it's an intellectual concept that you say you believe. Jesus heals the sick. Okay. But you say if you believe him, you abide in him, you should walk just as you walk. So where's the evidence of that life? Where's the evidence that you believe in me? Show me your faith and I'll show you my works. For faith without works is dead. That's what James said. I'll put it in another way. I'll put it in the original translation. Show me the faith and I will show you my works. 
For the faith, the faith without works is dead. That changes that scripture. What it does in that moment is it, it takes faith from the way that we see it within the church. That faith is like some emotional thing that we grab on. Like, oh, I need faith, I need faith, I need faith. That's not faith. And it changes the, I need to grab a hold of faith right now, to the faith, which is a person. So what it's really saying is, show me your Jesus, and I'll show you my works. Because if your Jesus does not manifest works, you have a dead Jesus. There's a lot of people, oh, I'll show you my Jesus. Huh? Where's your works? Where's the evidence of your faith? That you know him. That you behold him. That you spend hours and hours with him. Where's the evidence of it? Because to say I know something but not yet respond or manifest it is what we call hypocrisy. Just being honest. This is how I talk to my heart all the time. <laughs> I sit there and I'll preach and I'll be like, in the middle of it, the Lord will be like, when was the last time you tried to raise to somebody from the dead right now? Ooh. Okay. I need to go find a dead person. That's hard in the States to find dead people where you have access. Huh? It would be much easier in the Ukraine and Africa. But I have people all the time that message me and say, if I can get you with the body, <laughs> if I can get you with the body, will you come and raise them from the dead? I said, you get me with the body, and I'll come pray. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Would you be as bold like Smith to pull them out of a casket? Because they're stiff as a board, drag them across the room, put them in a corner? <laughs> <laughs> Command them to come to Jesus. Come on. Would you be as bold as that? You don't want to offend anyone, do you? That's the problem, isn't it? Because you think everybody's watching you, so if, if they then don't come alive. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know. They're, they're as good as dead. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like there was, a, there was a woman, she was mute. She had fallen and hit her head and her brain no longer would communicate with her vocal cords. She could hear. She just couldn't speak. She came to a meeting. They brought her up. The daughter said, here's my mom. She can't, she can't talk. She's mute. I said, does she understand what, I, what I'm saying? She says, yeah, she understands. I said, tell her to stick her tongue out. She stuck her tongue out. I grabbed a hold of her tongue. Now that could look strange. <laughs> But I grabbed a hold of her tongue and said, in the name of Jesus, release this tongue. Mm -hmm. Let go of her tongue. Went back in her mouth and she goes, amen, amen, amen. The <laughs> <laughs> daughter fell. The daughter just fell to the ground. You know, there was a guy, he wanted to get rid of smoking. So I, I just can't quit smoking. I said, stick your tongue out. Grabbed him by the tongue. I said, spirit of nicotine, get off his tongue right now in Jesus' name. He never spoke to him. Like, do we, do we have boldness to do these things? To spit in blind eyes? <laughs> the boldness to go and do that? That's what we need. Jesus did it. You have a boldness to just stop a random funeral that's going on and just say, hey, hold up. It's a funeral going on here. I'm going to go raise this person from the dead. I went down. It's late at night. I just preached at a drug rehabilitation center. I'm on my way home. As I'm driving on a country road, I see a car wrapped around a tree. I immediately think I'm going to get to raise somebody from the dead, so I was pretty excited. That's just, I'm just being honest. Like, I jumped out of the car. I put my headlights on the car. I said, is anybody in there? And I hear a guy out in the field in the dark saying no. It, it's just me. Nobody's in the car. I said, are you hurt? He said, I'm fine. I broke my arm. 
comes into the headlight, he's holding his arm like this. You can see the break in his arm. I said, uh, I said, do you want me to call 911? Emergency, have him come out. He said, no, I've got people on the way. I said, okay. I said, do you just want me to stay here until they get here? He said, yes. So I stayed there. I suddenly began to smell a little alcohol in his breath. It's early 30s. Then he, he's bold enough to tell me that his license was suspended a week. So his license is suspended. He's been drinking. And he's got a brand new Dodge Charger wrapped around a tree. He's a truck. So I'm starting to put his plan that he's formulated to put together here. He's going to have his dad come and duly pick up with a flatbed. And they're going to pull the car out. And they're going to make the wreck happen another day when he's not drunk. You know. And so, so that's their plan. So the wife drives up. She gets out of the car. She's kicking the car and stuff. They're cussing, screaming at each other, having a fight. They're both scared to death. They know, they know it's trouble. And so um, I walk up to him. I say, hey, I'm I, sorry. I, you know, I told you I'd wait until somebody got here. The wife looked around at me. She's smoking a cigarette. She looks around at me. She looks at me and she sees my shirt. I've got to ask me about Jesus' shirt on. <laughs> She goes, oh my goodness, I'm smoking a cigarette, my, my husband's saying F this, F that, and you haven't asked me about Jesus or not. She goes, we had just prayed at McDonald's the other day over our food. I said, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably need to pray over your food and eat it at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I would bless it a few times. <laughs> and I said, well, I just wanted to make sure he's okay. And I said, I got to do something before I leave. And he's still holding his arm like this. And you can see the break. She goes, what? I said, I'm going to pray over his arm and the break's going to go away. It's going to be healed instantly. That's what I said. I didn't say, let's see. I said, this is what's going to happen. So I reach over, grab his arm, and said, be healed in Jesus' uh, name. You yeah. hear a loud pop. And when it pops, he just starts going like this. And he's crying. He goes, what's going on with me? So that's Jesus. He falls in my arm. He starts crying. Now, as he falls into my arm, his, 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 his shoulder, his uh, right hand, his ar arm is right here. And he's crying on my shoulder. I'm holding him up. He has a tattoo on his arm that says, only God can judge me. So I whisper in his arm, in his ear. I said, hey, man, I want to tell you something. He goes, what? He said, God judged you worthy of life today. Amen. <laughs> you should give him your life. Yeah. Yeah. And he gave his life to Jesus right there. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> what are you going to do when you pull up on a car and say, what are you going to do when you're sitting having coffee and God says, get up, drive to this place right now. Leave your coffee, get up, and go. Get up in my car, start driving. Next thing I know, I see a car accident. A man hit a motorcycle right in front of me. The man gets ejected from the motorcycle, goes flying through the air, hits his head on the concrete. I leave my car in the middle of the road and jump out. I move everybody out of the way, and I say, God sent me here to heal you. I don't ask for permission. Not when God tells me to do something. So I lay my hands on him. He's in complete shock. He says, I can't feel anything. I can't feel my back at all, my spine. I said, well, you're going to be fine. I'm going to pray for you. I lay hands on him. And I said, just, I'll be right back. I walk over there, and there's a car. It's the kid that hit him. Sitting in his car, he's crying. He hasn't even put his car in park yet. He's just holding onto the steering wheel, weeping. I knock on the window. I said, hey, you need to get out of the car. He, he just immediately starts shouting on top of the slums. Is he dead? Is he dead? Is he dead? I said, no, he's not dead. He's going to be okay. But I need you to get out of the car. I pull him out of the car. I walk him over to the man that's laid in the street. The man looks at me and says, you won't believe this. I can feel my back. I said, oh, I can believe it. <laughs> I said, you're going to be completely fine in a second. 
And I said, I just need to introduce this guy to you. This is the kid that he was texting on his phone. He pulled out of the parking lot and hit you. Kids crying, weeping. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Man reaches up and grabs a hold of the kid's hand. And he says, son, it's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> kid just starts weeping uncontrollably. I take him back to his car, make sure he's okay. He's a Christian. Just did something stupid. I said, you're going to be okay. It's all going to work out. Went back to the man laying on the street. He goes, I can get up right now. I said, I know. He goes, there's a nurse here. She will. He pointed at the lady. It was a nurse that pulled up the side. She goes, he won't. She won't let me. I said, well, you're completely blind. I said, I hear the ambulance. They're going to check you out. I said, I'm going to leave before the police get here. So I don't have to file anything. He goes, what's your name? I said, it doesn't matter. Jesus sent me here. I jump back in my car. I drive off. I drive straight over to another place, grab another cup of coffee, because I left my last one. <laughs> so I gotta get a new cup. Then a bunch of people walk in, the glory of God hits them right there in Starbucks. Tip of them, right there in the middle. <laughs> a couple of them knew me. They just walked in and they were like, hey, it's Brett. So they walk over there. And we started talking and started talking about the move of God. They got really excited and laid my hand on the center of the table. And I said, Lord, I just released the glory of God over the center of this table right here. I said, who's bold enough to touch it? <laughs> they all kind of stood there like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> this girl had no clue. She walks in late. She walks over. She goes, hey, how you guys doing? And they said, you should touch the center of the table. She goes, why? <laughs> <laughs> So that you can have an encounter with Jesus. They were like, this is insane. They're looking around. They're like, we're like laughing and screaming. <laughs> and nobody even was paying attention. <laughs> I did that another time. I was in Colorado Springs. A pastor, a guy wanted to meet me. And so his pastor was worried. He didn't want him to meet me alone. I gotta check out this Brian Kelly guy. Make sure he's not weird. So the pastor shows up too, I mean, with my clock touch. So we're sitting at Starbucks, it's busy, it's crowded. And so this guy's sitting across from me, and he's just this young, younger guy, and he's just crying. He's like, I just, man, I just really want Jesus. I just want to encounter Jesus. I said, well, okay. I said, awesome. So I pointed at him, I said, come Holy Spirit, and he just slid right out of his seat <laughs> into the floor. So again, you would think a guy that's unconscious on the floor <laughs> would have somebody calling the police. And the pastor's just going, oh my gosh, right here? I was like, yeah. He goes, I said, I said, look around. Nobody's paying attention. He goes, you're serious? Like nobody's looking. I said, I know, there's just a person at the back. I said, you want to see something else? He goes, what? I get right in the middle of the floor at Starbucks and I go, Nobody looks. <laughs> that pastor was a believer that day. <laughs> Began to believe the Bible. He goes, this is Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> and everybody's like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> Hand it off to somebody else. <laughs> I just started believing it. I was just like the Holy Spirit. I remember the day he told me to start doing these things. It was just like training with the Lord. He would do, he would do crazy things like that. I would, like, like I told the story, I went... Walked to the bathroom one time. I, I was about to do it. So I just prayed over the doorknob going to the, to the meeting. I was just like, I walked past the door. I said, in the name of Jesus, I just released the glory right there on the doorknob. I go to use the bathroom. I come back. There's a whole pile of people at the door. Then it touched the doorknob. And we're just out. I have a video just from the youth conference the other day. Because all the interns stayed around and were like, okay, we want, we want to be heard some stories. We want to encounter some things. Six hours of them stuck to the floor. And so as they're trying to leave to go to their hotel, I just, I just walked past the, the, the door going out of the sanctuary. And I just said, Lord, just release the glory over this door. And I'm walking, and you, and Fred is on the other side of the church, and he's got his camera out, and you can see them trying to come through the door. <laughs> and they're like crawling across the floor, going, what's going on? <laughs> we used to just say these crazy things. I still see them. Every once in a while, the Lord's like, okay, I want to be a little playful. <laughs> Just do it. I, I feel them sometimes. There were times that I would, I would be sitting there, I would get playful, and the Lord would say, no, this is not the time. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> okay. And then other times, he was like, just do it. You, can, you, got, you got four hours. <laughs> Go have fun. And we would have fun. We, I, I promise, I had never burned so many calories from laughing my entire life. Uh, There's people just rolling around for hours and hours. Uh, uh, I've heard some crazy things. There was this poor girl, I promise. She was terrified. Because a friend of mine had told her that people could die in the glory. So as I'm praying for people, she's just over there in her chair, and she had done him on the floor, and she's going. And I get closer to her, and she goes, no. I said, are you okay? She goes, I don't want to die on the glory. I was like, well, who told you that? Well, someone so said I could die on the glory, and you keep praying for me. I was like, I'm so sorry, that's not true. So that girl... She had it out for me. She had it absolutely out. So I got the voice of the apostles. This is my most embarrassing story that has ever happened to me. And it includes Roland Baker. I will pay back Roland Baker for this. <laughs> so Roland's doing his meeting. He's having fun up front. He's walking over to people and zapping them with a the microphone. I don't know how it works, but he just goes, and then people were, ah, and just flip out. Under the glory. So he's having a whole lot of fun out there. We're all packed in. We're like Indian style. I'm like in the front. On the floor. There's no room. There's no room to move. Because everybody's also hoping the height is just going to come and just crawl around and take people to see Jesus. And so I'm, I'm sitting here. My friend Lydia, who came to the conference, because my wife had the kids, she was beside me. And then that girl that was afraid that I was going to kill him in the glory was on the other side. So, Roland's on the other side of the room. He's just walking over by people. Going, Psst. People are just laughing uncontrollably, fall out of their seats and stuff. This girl that we have brought to the conference in this holy moment stands up, jumps up, says, Roland! I'm like, oh my goodness, did she just scream his name? And she goes, get him! Get him! He always gets me! <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe she's doing this. There's like 500 people in this room. 
So Roland walks over with the microphone. <laughs> he walks over. And he holds out the microphone above my head. And I'm like, just go for it because I don't really feel anything. I'm just, I give a lot, but I, there's very few people that have ever really got me. And uh, so Roland's standing on the ground like, I'll take it, man. I'll take it. <laughs> sitting there on the floor. He looks over and goes, Psst, toward her. And when he does, my friend Lydia just falls back. Like, several people got hit all at the same time. Lydia, boom, she's out. This girl gets hit, and she looked like a jack in the box. She comes flying off the ground, <laughs> soars over Lydia, <laughs> and her head falls directly in my crotch. <laughs> and she's just going, <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying she's not my wife. <laughs> and he just looks down and goes, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I was like, one day, <laughs> one day, we're going to run into each other. <laughs> we're going to have the battle of the glory. <laughs> There's payback coming. <laughs> Most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. Our life. We never told that poor girl anything. <laughs> she just she just woke up. We kind of pushed her to the side, and she was like, "So did he get you? <laughs> did you get it? I hope you got it." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good." She's like, "I don't remember anything." I was like, "Well, you don't need to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> just don't remember anything." We have never told her. She is married. She's got kids. <laughs> She would have been so embarrassed. Poor girl. I was embarrassed. I went home and told my wife. I was like, you won't believe what happened today. <laughs> she was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, I was terrible. <laughs> so we just see the glory just explode. It's going to get wild, man. It's going to get fun. Come on. God wants to move. He wants to touch people. When we don't restrict him to religion and all this other stuff. But it's the ability to know what is there for reconciliation and what is there for entertainment. It's very important. Holy Spirit is not here to entertain you. He's here to reconcile you. And knowing the difference between that is vital. So do we truly care here? What we say we believe. Who we say we believe. Are we willing to live by that voice? I love that voice. I can, I can tell you honestly, I have forgotten 90% of the testimonies. I just, every, every now and then, you know, I just walked into the meeting last, last Sunday or last weekend. And as soon as I walked into the meeting in Kansas City, the first thing that happened was a guy ran up to me and said, I had cancer, you prayed for me. I went back two days later, cancer's fine. It was the first thing, first thing that happened when I walked through the door. Then other people, I was completely healed. This happened, that happened. You know, it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing what God wants to do when we just say we believe. But he wants to increase that. There's these moments where you can come into agreement with heaven in such a way. You know, I, like I said, I try to stay very obedient to the voice. And it's fun where that voice will take you. Like, it's, it's, I include him in everything I do most of the time. So, even if I'm just buying a car, I include him into it. You know, the last person that I went and bought a car from, you know, they got healed. They were part of the church now. They, they, everything I put on Facebook, they share. That was like five years ago. <laughs> They're still watching my life. Because the Lord said, Bye, go there. So I went there. And I suddenly realized I'm not there for the car. I'm there for them. 
And that's just, that happens in my life, you know. One of my favorite stories was, there was this autistic kid that started coming to our meetings and his dad called me up. He had, his dad knew me from another state. He said, hey, I, you know, you might have seen a kid come in there, his name's Jared, that's my son. I sent him to your meetings. He's probably like 22, 23 years old. Autistic, would, would, most of the time wouldn't even say anything, wouldn't even say a word, but just hide in the back. Yeah. And as soon as everybody would leave, then he would come out and he would ask me a thousand questions. You know, why was that guy per puking on the floor? Like, what was going on there? <laughs> you know, we had all kinds of things. Sometimes our house meetings went, you know, 10, 12 hours. We went from the, the sun setting to the sun rising a lot of times. You know, like round four would start around four o'clock in the morning. And, and so we were just, we were just hungry. So this kid would come. And then one day, Jared stopped coming. Jared's gone. We don't know where Jared's at. I, I just thought, you know, people come and they go. And they come in for a season and they leave and that's okay. Well, a couple months later, the dad calls me and says, hey, have you seen Jared? And I said, I haven't seen him for a couple months. Because, oh my goodness, we can't find Jared. Apparently, he started smoking weed to try to calm his anxiety. His aunt found out. She kicked him out of the house. He ran off. Nobody knows where Jared's at. I said, oh, man. I said, well, well, let's pray. I prayed. I said, Lord, send someone to Jared. Send someone to find Jared. And so a month that went past, and I was uh, going to Colorado Springs for two weeks. The entire family was coming with me. We had four kids at the time. And we jump in the car. We drive all the way to Colorado from Nashville. I do two weeks of ministry up there. After we're done, some people had sewn into us. And we were halfway to a national park called Yellowstone. So I just told them, I said, hey, why don't we just go to Yellowstone? My wife's like, can we afford them? Can we do it? And I said, yeah, let's just do it. I said, I just feel like we should go to Yellowstone. So we go to Yellowstone. You know, again, I'm just like, I feel like we should go do this. So we get in the car, we drive to Yellowstone, we get to Jackson Falls, we see the Great, great Tetons, and then we realize Jackson Falls is a very expensive place to go. And so we go to the closest city that we could, could go to to find a hotel, and that was Boise, Idaho. So we go to Boise, and we get a hotel. Um, all the crazy adventures that happen, you know, with four kids. Um, you know, one of our sons had a blowout in the car. You know, nasty diaper, made the whole car smell terrible. <laughs> you get to take the car seat out at the hotel, find a hose pipe, and, and wash it out. And then next thing you know, you're taking a bar of soap in the bathtub and you're hand washing car seats. And, you know, all that wonderful stuff that happens. So it's a lot of sleepless nights. And so the next day, you know, we, we get in the car and I drive about 18 hours total. Um, because we, we go through the park, we go and see Old Faithful and all the stuff that's in the park, the bison and all that. And so at the end of the day, we're like, okay, we got to go find a place to stay. The closest place at that point is a place called Bozeman, Montana. So we drive out to Bozeman, Montana. It is, I am, I am so tired. Like it is now like 1.30 at night. I've been driving since about 7.30 that morning. And I'm just ready to just crash. So I find a hotel. I noticed there was a gas station when I got in that was open. So we stop at a hotel. I get out. We put the kids down. Of course, the kids don't want to get down because they've been strapped in a car seat most of the time. So all they want to do is run around for the next hour and a half while you want to sleep. So my wife looks at me. I drive already. I my PJs on. I'm in bed. I'm crashing. And she's like, hey, we don't have any milk. Like, no. She goes, you're going to have to go get some milk. I was like, I don't know if anything's open. She was like, well, there's that one gas station. I was like, oh, my gosh. Okay, so I'm in my PJs, put my shoes on, jump out of the car, or jump in the car, I drive to this gas station, the only gas station open. And I'm thinking ahead. I'm thinking I'm going to get some donuts. I'm going to get breakfast stuff. I'm going to get anything and everything, orange juice so that I can buy some sleep in the morning. So just let the kids just have it when they wake up and let them just tear into it and I'm gonna sleep. So I just grab all this stuff. I just got a handful of just junk pretty much because that's all you're gonna find at a gas station at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I grab it all 
and I walk over, I put it on the counter. And the guy's not checking me out. And I look up, it's Jared. No, Jared, the one that's went missing. He's only about 3,000 miles from my house. <coughs> wow. 3,000 miles from my house, working the night shift at 2 o'clock in the morning in Bozeman, Montana, the only gas station that's open. Let's just say Jared was scared out of his mind. <coughs> <laughs> he just looks at me and tears start coming down his face. He goes, what are you doing here? I said, Jesus sent me. <laughs> I knew at that moment, Jesus sent me. I'm wide awake now. I'm ready to go. Jesus has now entered the building. Let it, let's do it. And Jared's like, there's, dude, no, no. There's no way that you're here right now. I said, I'm here. I'm here. He goes, nobody knows I'm here. It's the only guy I wasn't supposed to work tonight. And the guy canceled this shift. And I, I got called in to work. I said, I know, God wanted us to talk. And he goes, there's, there's, there's no way, it has to be God. God's real, God's real, man. God's real. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, no is. <laughs> I lead Jared to Jesus right there. Bozeman, Montana, to around 2.30 at that point. As he's weeping and sobbing. And he's just like, this can only be God. There's no way that this could even happen. Yeah. I said, I know. I know. I, was, I went back to my hotel room and my wife was like, where have you been? <laughs> I have had angry children <laughs> waiting for milk. <laughs> and, you, and I said, I was at the gas station. I ran into somebody. She was like, who did you run into? I was like, Jerry. She goes, who's Jerry? I said, remember the kid that used to come to our Bible studies? Back in Nashville. She goes, are you kidding me? Jared? I said, yes. That's why we're here. We're here for Jared. She started crying. <laughs> she started crying. I hopped in bed while I was ready to sleep. I feel the pleasure of the Lord. Two hours later, the phone starts ringing. It's the dad. He's calling me at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Brent. I just got off the phone with Jim. I said, I know. He goes, what are you doing in Bozeman, Montana? I said, apparently I came for Jared. He goes, I haven't talked to my son in five months. And I get a call at 3.30 in the morning with my son in tears telling me that you walked into a gas station and led him to Jesus in Bozeman, Montana. At 3.30, at 2.30 in the morning. I said, yes, I did. He goes, that's, that's crazy. Bro. I mean, we just talked on the phone like two months ago when you said, Lord, send someone to preach. <laughs> send someone to find Jared. <laughs> did you ever imagine that you were going to be the person that would travel 3,000 miles to lead Jared to Jesus? I was like, I have no clue. But I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, I'm going to let you sleep, but I want to hear more about this. Hundreds of stories just like Jerry. I have people that send me photos of their children that are missing. And they're like, this is what he looks like. Can you just pray that God just brings him right into the middle of your day and you just walk face to face with him? I was like, I will. I will. I was just with a friend, Julie True. She does uh, soaking worship with uh, Kimberly and Alberto Rivera. And Julie, is, I mean, she's got great, great soaking worship. Um, she kind of really started that with Kimberly and Alberto. And their son had been missing, and she came to me, and a leader to me, and she was like, I heard you have this thing of finding people that are missing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. She was like, can I show you a picture of him and see if you find him? I said, well, you know what, I'm going to do this. He's going to come back. He did like two weeks later, two months later. He just showed up one day, just broken. And there, there's all kinds of things. I've been at, I've been having meetings in the middle of the day, and I'd be like, hey, you know, I'd tell a story about somebody, and be like, yeah, there's this guy, man, he really hated me, totally got wrecked by Jesus in a meeting of mine. 
and I would be talking about them. And then all of a sudden, that person who was driving through from Canada and stopped at a donut shop that was near me walked right up to the table. He's like, um, Brent Kelly? I was like, dude, I was just talking about you like 15 minutes ago. He was like, are you kidding? Like, I was just driving through. I was ministering in Canada, and I was driving back to Florida. And you were just talking about Yeah, yeah. It's just talking about you. God just does those things all the time. When you get in tune with the Spirit, you will understand that it isn't intuition that you're feeling a lot of times. It's a Spirit. Mm -hmm. Why do I feel this when I get around this person? Understanding discernment. See, do you understand discernment? What is discerning the Spirit's? You know, I use it this way. I, I remember just telling the story the last night. There was a girl, she got upset because of a post I write on Facebook. Sometimes I write posts on Facebook that make people upset. This post apparently made her upset. I don't know why. Um, I said a woman claiming that her period gives her the right to be angry is no different than a man claiming his testosterone gives him the right to look at a woman. That made her upset. She goes, who do you think you are? She writes me, she's, she's angry. And I start realizing that she's got a failing marriage and everything's falling apart. She's upset because of the things her husband has said to her. You're just emotional, you're just this, and all that kind of stuff. And so, okay. But while I'm talking to her, all of a sudden, I had a sexual thought about that woman come to my head. And my wife was sitting across from me, and I just looked, I put my phone down and said, I just had a sexual thought about this woman coming to my head. My wife goes, what? I said, yeah. She goes, well, what's that about? I said, well, she carries a spirit on her. And anytime she goes to counseling or to pastors or different things for counsel, there's a spirit that projects these thoughts. You know what it does? The men, the pastors, out of the idea of guarding their heart, Close down and remove themselves from her and can't offer her help because they're fearful of that image. My wife goes, well, What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to become her friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to love the hell out of her. That's what I said. That's just my response. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of that thing. That's what the devil wants you to do be fearful. I don't have anything to be fearful. Why? Because it's not an issue. If, 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 I was, if I have an issue with it, then yeah, maybe I'm fearful. But we have this whole thing of like, you know, spiritual warfare, all this stuff. We take Job. You know, Job, I make a covenant with my eyes. They say, look upon a woman with lust. Commit adultery. Well, I mean, every, every men's group I went to from the time I was 12, they quoted that scripture. Got to make a covenant with their eyes. Got to make a covenant with their eyes. Bunch of men walking around going. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help. We gotta go to the New Testament. I make a covenant with my heart, and Jesus gives me new eyes. Yeah, that's so much better. I make a covenant with my heart, meaning He has my heart, and if He has my heart, then that doesn't have my heart. And he gives me new eyes, so no, no man after the flesh, only after the spirit. Boy, that really helps situation. <laughs> Jesus was walking around. I mean, I mean, come on. They pulled the woman in the act of adultery into the street. I don't think they gave her time to get dressed. So there's this new prostitute in the street. They want her to look disgusting. So what it, does Jesus walk up? Oh, let me come in with my eyes. Um, can somebody please put something over her right now? I don't want to lust. No, not Jesus. Why? Because he has the ability to look at what's in front of him and not see the flesh. But to see the heart and the spirit. It's beautiful. It's amazing. He gave him authority. See, you only have authority over what you love. Not over what you lust, but what you love. And my ability to be put in situations that might be uncomfortable to solve. 
Yeah. I remember my mom I one time. We were we were in Stockholm, Sweden. It was really cold, so we got those fingerless gloves. Because that's all we could find. So we had fingerless gloves on, just <laughs> freezing there. We're walking through Stockholm, we're at a conference. And there was this girl that followed me from one of the conferences, one of the meetings. She had seen me at a meeting. I'm with my wife. Nobody knows we're married because we've got fingerless gloves on. We can't see our rings. And so, and then half of the time, I'm like ministering to people and stuff like that. So this girl, she sees me at the train station at Central Station. She runs over to me, man. She gives me the biggest hug. And she's like, oh, you're just so amazing. And I look over at my wife. After she gave me the hug, I walk over to my wife. My wife's like, I don't like her. <laughs> it's like, why? You know why. I was like, you want to see what I do? She goes, okay, do it. I walk over to her and I'm like, hey, can I pray for you? Can I, let me hold your hands. She goes, sure. She gets me her hands. And then I say, come Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, she's on the floor <laughs> at the train station, crying like a baby, screaming the name of Jesus. <laughs> My wife comes over and she's got her hands laid on. She goes, oh, Jesus, I love you, I love you so much. And she's ministering. I walk away, and my wife looks at me, and she goes, that's what you do on those college campuses, isn't it? I said, yeah. I said, trust me, she ain't thinking about me right now. <laughs> She's having a encounter with Jesus. I, Jesus is way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I do. Listen, I do it. He became my fulfillment. That's just the reality. Like, there's nothing that fascinates Fascinates me as much as Jesus. I'm telling you, if somebody wants to try to sit down and flatter me and try to romance my heart other than my wife, you're just going to hear the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> because I really have no other conversation. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Like movies? Like, I don't care about movies. I care about Jesus. The only time I was solicited was actually by a homosexual man. It was quite interesting. Yeah, he sent me a message on Facebook. He said, I would really like to hang out with you and get to know you in a very intimate way. I was like, intimate way? Then he wrote back sexually. I sent him a voicemail. <laughs> no, I sent him a voicemail. It's great. I just, as soon as I got on there and did the voicemail on Facebook, I just said, come out, you homosexual devil in the name of Jesus. <laughs> His next message was very interesting. He sent me a voice message. He goes, what's happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> I sent him another one back. Come out all the way in the name of Jesus. He didn't send a message back. See, I'm just not, in, I'm not intimidated. I'm just going to come after that thing. I'm going to expose it for what it is. See, my life is literally an open book. My life, see... I can give my wife somewhere with my phone. Here it is. I can give her this phone. She knows the password, she knows the code, she knows everything. I can hand it to her, and I'm not worried one bit about what she can find on the same. Because I'm free. See, porn is not your issue. Jesus is. Porn is the fruit of an issue, it's not the root of an issue. Let Jesus fulfill your heart. Let Jesus romance your heart. Let Jesus have your heart. And nothing else does. So there's nothing I would rather do than be in his presence. You know what? When I get home, guess what I'm going to do? My wife is going to have coffee waiting for me. She's going to wake me up early. She's going to be like, let's sit down. Let's have our little coffee meeting. And let's talk about Jesus. Because that's what we do. Two or three hours. And then I'll get up and I'll preach just like this. And then she'll tell me to calm down. <laughs> she's the only one there. <laughs> and I'm like hopping. I'm like, no, like, Jesus is me. She's like, calm down. <laughs> this is what I do. He stole my heart. Wow. 
why would I do anything to try to break that covenant? Why would I think about another one? He would never dissatisfy me. And he calls me over and over to come running to him. It's like I did last night. And I would just say, whisper the name of Jesus, and people would get hit, because he comes running. He loves what we call his name. He loves to encounter us. He takes pleasure in us. And when you understand there is not one sin against you, there's nothing separating. You know why when the devil comes up there? Do you know what? You know what? You know what Matt did? You know what Jesus says? Who's Matt? You know that guy Matt. I don't know Matt. Well, yeah, you know Matt. Nope. Really don't know him. Why? I mean, there was a guy, Matt, he died. I got this, got this little stone in my pocket. And it's, it's, got, it's got this guy's name written on it that no one else knows. So it says that he, he writes our names on a stone. And no man knows our name but him. That's how intimate you are with God. So the devil comes up, well, yeah, it's that Matt guy. I, I seriously don't know Matt. I know this guy. His name's written on the stone here, but you don't know his name. There's no accusation you can bring toward him. Because <laughs> you don't know his name. And he keeps it hidden within him. You're hidden within him. Now the, the danger of bringing judgment against another person that's in him that I demand justice. You know what they said about me, Jesus? I demand justice. Ooh, that's dangerous. Why is that dangerous? Because in order for Jesus to bring judgment and justice in that situation toward them would mean that he would have to stand up in the mercy seat. And to stand up in the mercy seat means that we are not covered by the mercy seat. We never Upset to be angry toward anyone. And to do so is to demand Jesus to stand for the mercy seat. For we're all covered. <laughs> You're 100% innocent. Every single person in this room is innocent. If you accepted the blood, and you have had that seed of the living God planted inside of your heart. You're 100% a new creation in Christ Jesus. We take the allegorical saying of as far as the east is from the west that he'll take your sins, he'll throw them in the seed of forgiveness. Well, what is the seed of forgiveness? Well, that's, that's the death burial of Christ. He went and he was swallowed up by the earth. The seed of forgiveness. It's a, it's, a, it's a terminology of being swallowed up into the heart of the earth. So he took your sins upon himself and it was swallowed up into the heart of the earth. To be remembered. And, and, and hell could not hold him. It could not hold him down there. If you understood the victory Well, I'm just having a hard time overcoming it. Listen, I'm having a hard time with the situation. I'm having a hard time believing this. There's only one answer. I have one answer. Jesus. People come to me, I have this problem. Jesus. But do you have another answer? Jesus. Do you have a 12-step program? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> do you have any other answer than Jesus? No. Nope. Because 
Only a thief crossed through a window instead of comes, coming through the door. So Jesus said, don't be a thief who tries to crawl through the window. There's no shortcuts. There's only intimacy. Come to me. I'm the door. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man has access to the Father unless he comes through me. We need an encounter with Jesus. And I need it every day. What, what was the rule? To the Israelites go and collect manna every day. Every day. You need daily bread every day. You need to feast upon the Lord every day. Have an intimate moment with him every day. I don't need him just in the morning. Wearing a shirt or having a coffee mug that says Jesus and coffee. It's not intimacy with Jesus. <laughs> You're not having your coffee together with Jesus. Go get alone with him. Let this word penetrate your heart. Ask him to teach you the word. Yeah. You're not reading it to qualify yourself but to explore the boundaries of your inheritance. You're called to take it. There's enough people in this room right now to take this city. Come on. Yeah. There's enough people in this room to take this city. There's enough faith in this room that if you really put it to work and you say, you know what, that little patch of concrete right there in front of this church. Mm. Right there. <laughs> Just let a river of the glory <laughs> just right there on that patch of concrete. <laughs> that every person that has to walk on that piece of concrete <laughs> just gets hit by the glory of God. And have an encounter of Jesus. They don't know why they're having an encounter of Jesus. Every time they walk through, they just hear the name of Jesus. Oh, where did that come from? Are they playing something in there? Church, what, what is that? What's that feeling every time I walk in front of that door? Do you believe it? Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. How much I believe it? You want to know how much? I used to go out and lay my hands on concrete. <laughs> and then sit on a bench and watch people get hit by the glory of God. <laughs> you know how fun that is? And Lord, I just release your glory in the name of Jesus. Everybody who walks over here just gets hit by the glory. God, I'm just going to go find a seat right here on this park bench and I'm just going to watch this happen. And then I would watch it happen. That's expectation. That's believing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to stand on that. I truly believe that if I do that, things will happen. That's why I see. That's why I know. If I pray for a microphone, something's going to happen. That's why I know if I touch you, something's going to happen. What happens when you truly believe? Oh, man, it gets crazy. It gets crazy. The testimonies just begin to pile up like the bodies on the concrete. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have, sometimes I just have signs in the back of my car. One of them is, ask me for prayer. I just pull in up and just go jump on a street corner and just hold the sign up. Ask me for prayer. People just come over and ask me for prayer. Pray for them. Amazing things happen. Sometimes I have a dry race board. Those are fun too. Dry race boards are incredible. I would just take a dry race board and I would just, Lord, give me a name. He'd give me the first and last name. So then you get to walk down the street with the first and last name written on the board and somebody stops you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my name. I know. I, why is my name right on the board? Jesus told me to write your name on the board. Why? Because he wants to talk to you. You know how fun that is? <laughs> then I just write left arm hurts. People come up to you and be like, my arm hurts pretty bad. Why do you have that on the board? Because I'm going to pray for you and it's going to be healed. No. No. You're kidding. No, I'm going to pray for you. Lay hands on all so the arm gets healed. Uh, 
Okay, that, that, dude, that's weird. Yeah. No, it's, it's Jesus. One time I just wrote, let me pray for you. I think that was someone that said, do you need prayer? I'm walking, there's this bar, and there's a bouncer in front of the bar. This guy's big, and he's a bouncer. He's, he's supposed to be tough. And as I'm walking past the bar, I hear this really quiet voice say, And I turned around and said, did you, did you say something? Oh, no. I said, no, no, you, you said something. Did you, did you just ask for prayer? And he looks up and he goes, yeah, come on. My mom's a diabetic and she's in a bad place right now. This big old guy, bouncer at a bar. And I said, can I pray for you? I would, I would love that, man. Reach over there with my hands. Like, like seriously, I remember one time we were at a, a Denny's. They're always open. It's like a pancake joint with really terrible food that you eat at late enough. Yeah. Because it's the only thing open. And you get to meet some interesting people there. So we've got two homeless people outside, so we brought them in to feed them with us, and one of them fell into his pancakes. That's a whole other story. <laughs> It was amazing. He was just wrecked by Jesus. I had my friend Michael Joe with me. He was rocked. Um, some of the seed bank guys, they wanted to see what, what I do. That was the thing. They were like, we just want to see what you do. What they didn't expect is me paying a, uh, there was a pimp that he had his prostitute with him. And so we actually, we, we paid the pimp $50 so we could preach the gospel to the prostitute. So we did. We said, man, I know she's on duty right now, but can we have can we have a little bit of time with her? He goes, what do you mean? I said, we'll give you $50 to so let us talk to her. Okay, fine. And then we sit down and begin to talk to her. And we said, we know there's all kinds of dysfunction. He's sitting at the table. I go, I know there's all kinds of dysfunction here, but I'm just gonna say, you're her pimp and you have a crush on her. What do you mean? I don't, I don't like her. I was like, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You've actually tried to protect her a few times from some situations because you're pretty jealous. You just start breaking down. Man. She's losing it. It's all that kinds of crazy dysfunction. And we're just right there in the middle of it. Just love it all. Preaching the gospel. They're both crying. They give their lives to Jesus. Two o'clock in the morning at Denny's. <laughs> Crazy things happen at 2 o'clock in the morning. I had a friend, she said, can you come pray for my daughter? I said, sure. She does some crazy stuff. I knew she was like a professional dancer, not like a stripper or anything like that, but she, she danced for like music videos and things like that. And so, so I'm sitting, my wife went with me, and we're sitting there, and I said, so here's the deal, Madeline, um, Friday nights, you're doing not full on strip tease or anything like that, but you're doing cabaret shows, aren't you? She looks at me, she goes, Yeah. She goes, It pays the bills, it's my rent. I said, Okay. She had just given her life to Jesus. I said, You know, that, that really hurts the heart of the world because you're worth so much more than that. She goes, And she just had an encounter with Jesus. I said, so here's the deal, man. How much do you make? Well, oh, two fifty a night on Friday night. I said, I will give you a thousand dollars to not do the next four shows. She goes, What? I said, I will give you a thousand dollars not to do cabaret shows for the next four weeks. If you promise me that you will go and spend time with Jesus instead of going out with your friends. And she just began to weep. Like, do we, are we willing to do this? That's right. It's like I said, where does a prostitute in the New Testament get enough money to buy oil? You know, the prostitute in the New Testament, she pours oil. 
The costly perfume on the feet of Jesus. Where does a prostitute get money to buy oil that costs a year's worth of salary? It was expensive. Meaning that she prostituted herself out. The very perfume and oil she poured upon the feet of Jesus came from her prostitution. Think about that. Jonathan Edwards says it this way, the only thing that qualifies you for salvation is the sin that made it necessary. The sins. Jesus said that oil anointed him for his death. Her sins anointed him for his death. That's amazing. That's the kind of Jesus that takes a moment like that and just, oh man, the world was offended. The Pharisees were like, do you know? I'm sure they were probably putting two and two together. You know where she got that oil? You know where she got that from? Yeah. You know what type of woman she is? Mm -hmm. That she loves much because she was forgiven much. I'll pray for you in a second, man. Hey, me too. Tonight, I want you to come back with every expectation that you're going to have the greatest glory encounter with Jesus that you've ever had. That it is going to be so holy. That there is a level of deep repentance within the church. That's what he's wanting to do right now with the church. Yeah. Since the church needs to be in a deep place of repentance. Stop playing church. Become the gospel. Walk it out. And so, here's the deal. I have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see what he pours out. But I want you to just come with your hands, just open before the Lord. I want to give you my whole heart. I want to give you Let the God of peace crush Satan underneath mm -hmm. you. God, he wants to save you free. Yeah. Not just that, he wants you to become that living epistle that takes dominion over all the works of the enemy. Mm -hmm. That you stand upon the heads of scorpions and serpents. Come on. You crush it underneath your feet. Devil has no authority. So we're going to cast out devils from him to sin tonight. Come on. Go preach the gospel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.